Good evening. Uh, my name is Penny Billington. I'm going to give it two minutes or one minute for people to switch on because I'm just warming up for tea with a druid. Cheers, everyone. Hello, someone's joined immediately. Thank you very much, um, prompt person. That's fabulous. And a few more are some names coming through that I know now. That's wonderful. I am a new face, Rebecca, yes. And someone's kind enough to say yay, which is really good. I'll tell you who I am in just a moment. Calgary, people from Calgary. Good to see you too, Brian. Yes. Hello, Corrine. This is wonderful. Last week, Philip said, um, the first couple of live broadcasts were made him very nervous. And I'm here to tell you that he got that right. But I shall plod on and we'll see how we go. Um, hello, Pat. Ah, oh, from, someone from Nebraska and from Swansea, the Netherlands. Oh, someone from around the corner and someone from Germany. Marlene, yes. I shouldn't really be mentioning names because there are a lot here that I recognise and you're very welcome. For those pe people who don't uh, know me, which you might not if you're um, a visitor to the OBOB page, my name's Penny Billington and I've been editing the Order magazine Touchstone uh, since about 2001 and I, I'm quite active in the Order, doing all sorts of exciting druidy things. Hello from Florida. And Wisconsin and Germany. Thank you. What a lovely message. Oh, yes, yeah, someone down in Devon there. Yep. Tacoma. Oh, and uh, a couple of uh, my grove now. Someone from London. This is great. People are pouring in. So, I'm the druid that you're having tea with this evening. I hope you've all got a cup of tea because, um, unlike Dave, I don't play fast and loose with that tea coffee nonsense. I've got a lovely cup of chai here, spiced tea, uh, ready, and I'm ready to toast Philip and Stephanie. Oh, someone from Tintagel, Wales, Essex, Athens, and, and someone from Glastonbury down the road. I'm uh, in Somerset, very near to Glastonbury. And someone else li likes chai. Good. It's drink of the gods. Nectar and ambrosia rolled into one. Well, I shall periodically glance across and keep saying hello. Hello to the person from Colorado. Fabulous. Um, while we, as I say, yes, I should toast Philip and Stephanie because I like to think that they're somewhere in an ancient forest, uh, dim and mysterious, and possibly going on a quest for a unicorn. So, good luck with that, Philip and Stephanie. Um, look out for hellebore flowers, for primroses. Look out for those big ladies' mantle leaves, because they like sipping the dew from those. And apart from that, you'll need a, an open and generous heart so you're in with a very good chance there and um oh probably a large gin and tonic as well so i want to talk a bit about uh unicorns today but let's just yeah chai is lush and there's my phone misbehaving cancel everything georgia ginger and lemon tea who mentioned gin? Yes, they're the usual suspects. Um, what was I saying? Unicorns. I want to talk about unicorns tonight. And um, what I want to say to you is that if you're the sort of person who reaches for the off switch when they hear the word unicorns, you're exactly the person I want to um, stay switched on. Because I do think they're really relevant to Druidry and I'm hoping to persuade you of how by the end. So just a couple more check-ins. Utah, someone's having tea with mint there. 
Yep. People love unicorns and people love tea. So we're all in the right place this evening. That's great. Lots of little hearts going out for unicorns. Um, unicorns, talking about unicorns might seem frivolous um, when we live in a world that really asks us to be serious and there are many things to be serious about. But I've been thinking about, about unicorns. The first thing I was that I bought, I love books with surreal titles. What's the name title of this book? It's called A Field Guide to Identifying Unicorns by Sound. And I thought that's got to be, got to be the book for me. It's a weird, strange, amazing book. You can get it from a website that is Wonderella, as in wonder, rather than Cinder, Cinderella, Wonderella, a field guide to studying unicorns by sound. I thought, what's all that about? And I was amazed to find find that um, it really helped me with my practical druidry. So I'm going to pass on what I found to you. Um, I'm not, I think we approve of the person who's having nettle tea uh, this evening as well. Tea covers a multitude of uh, uh, descriptors, doesn't it? If we can have lemon and, lemon and ginger, we can certainly have nettle or mint. Right. Um, I'm going to stop looking over here because I'm getting so distracted. Um, suddenly, unicorns were everywhere. I bought the book. It was fabulous. I remembered the old um, film I'd seen uh, called The Last Unicorn, based on a wonderful book by Peter Beagle. Um, and uh, then I switched on Radio 4, our premiere of public service radio and suddenly a man with the library was talking about unicorns in the fifth century it was marvelous here are all the hearts going across the screen i don't know how philip manages to talk it's all so exciting so the last unicorn by peter s beagle it was reviewed and it was called whimsical lyrical poignant and timeless as a film and I thought, well, actually, all those words are very useful for describing the ways we feel when we think about our druidry. There is a poignancy to the magic of druidry in a difficult world. There's a lyrical quality to the wonderful rituals that we, uh, we have. There's a whimsicality in engaging with this nature religion. And of course, we enter timelessness. So it all seems um, and serendipitous. It's serendipitous as well. Um, so this is just what we need, I think. So the first question you might ask. Question one. Do I believe in unicorns? That's the wrong question. I would say I'm not answering that question. What I'm going to say is I don't believe in unicorns. I know unicorns. Just as I don't believe I'm a druid, I know I'm a druid. I know unicorns from the deep places in my mind and in my psyche. I know them from my childhood and I know them from myth and from legend and I know them as wonderful archetypes typal symbols as something very 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 important in my life so i know unicorns and some of you are saying over here yes you know as well hello people are still saying hello <gasps> i don't believe this i shall throw this out the window in a minute um so i know unicorns in a very deep way but i live in a world that says unicorns aren't real and by saying they're not real, they're sort of saying they're not important to me. And that's complete nonsense because they are completely important to me and completely alive within me. When I insist that unicorns are important, then I'm reclaiming the spiritual life, the internal life that I really have to have for my stability, for my sanity, for my mental health, balancing 
the important outside world, and it is important, against the equally important world of my spirit. Um, incidentally, if anyone wonders what would happen if a unicorn literally came into the world, I've got a book to recommend to you. Alan Garner, Elidor, when two worlds meet, a mythic world and an everyday world with alarming consequences, absolutely dreadful. Um, so uh, Alan Garner, Garner Elidor, all the realms that we have are inside us. They are, that's our buffer zone. We don't go out and expect to meet unicorns in the real world, but we do expect to meet them in our internal space. The fun part comes, the fun part, when we act as if, knowing what the reality is, but acting as if we could really see them. Um, I hope people don't think this is too frivolous. If they do, I would remind them that the Dalai Lama famously loves silly films and uh, was practically raised on Charlie Chaplin when uh, Heinrich Harrer became his uh, tutor in uh, just after the Second World War. Uh, spiritual people love silliness, love frivolity, love the surreal. Why? Because it gets it out of the, us out of the mindset of thinking that this world we live in is all important and we have to abide by its rules and believe entirely in its reality. What was that book again? The book was Elidor by Alan Garner. A children's book, so it won't take you very long um, to get through it. Um, very well worth a read. Um, so here is the crux of the matter. When we decide to become druids, we take it very seriously. And it's really good to do that because it shows that we're people of integrity and that we want to do things properly. We want to respect and honour um, our spiritual lives. But unfortunately, we bring to it all the lessons we taught from the out we've been taught by the outside world, which is that performance is important, that someone is judging us, that there's a pecking order and a hierarchy and all sorts of things. And how does that make us feel? Ah, if our inner world is rich, we enrich the outer world for ourselves and others. Yes, that's true. So if we come to Druidry and we, we bring in all these ideas of performance related targets, then we come out of a ritual and we say, oh, did I do it right? And of course, time, place, person, if we were there and doing it with integrity, it was right. Even if we tripped over our shoelaces and made a mess of the words, that doesn't do, that's not important at all. What's important is inside us. Um, so if we bring our anxieties and things, we won't make a good contact with the other world. If we bring a belief in unicorns, if we bring playfulness, an idea that the world could be surreal and amazing and alarming and surprising, we'll find it, our druidry far more fun. We will engage in the magic. We need a light touch for the magic of druidry. So we'll have to do a little exercise in a minute to practice that together. Just let me see. Oh, someone from Italy? Unicorns are wonderful. Oh, someone says they feel like that about... I'll just throw this out the window. I do not do technology. It's not really out the window. Right. Um, so we bring to our druidry, by belief in unicorns, we bring to our druidry an idea of lightness and fun and excitement and magic. So it's instead of thinking, will I do the ritual right? Will it, have I got everything? Have I got the candles? Who's bringing the incense? What we think instead is, I'm going to engage with the other worlds, with magic, with my gods and goddesses, or, or if I don't believe in gods and goddesses, with the trees, 
I'm going to have a relationship with the natural world enhanced by my druidry. Um, the world invites us to sleepwalk through life. Druidry invites us, poof, wake up, to wake up. But with the best will in the world, we can start sleepwalking again. We go into, uh, we go on our daily walk because we're druids. What happens? It's a grey, miserable, wet, dreary day, foggy, misty. And we're not really being very druidic. We're sort of marking time. We're sleepwalking. So what do we do? Imagine we're hunting a unicorn. Step outside. Wake up, says someone in, uh, in large capitals. We step outside. We find a portal place. We find a gate or we go between two trees or we just stop and think and we say, may I see a wonderful thing on this walk? And then we imagine we're looking for a unicorn. And suddenly every bit of mist, every bit of drizzle, every bit of cloud might be concealing a horn or an eyelash or a tail. And every sense is alive and alert to what is actually there. The bird song, the drips of the rains, the magical rainbows that are in the puddles. And suddenly we're awake and we're alive again. I feel unicorns are drawing quite close now. I'd like to invite you, as Philip does, to just relax. Enter into a relaxed state. Shut your eyes, perhaps, or lower them, and together we'll just go to a grove and we'll imagine that we're questing for a unicorn and see what happens. So I'm just, I'm stopping looking at all these fascinating comments now, which are so welcome, so interesting. But for now, I'm going to find myself in my inner grove. I'm going to be on the edge of a forest and I hope that you'll join me. And I hope that you'll be in your part of the world in a place you're completely comfortable with. And you're going to wrap a brownie green cloak around you because you're hunting for a unicorn. And unicorns, as we know, are very shy and they are masters of disguise because that's why no one sees them these days. So we must be very quiet and still and listen and walk slowly. And as we walk along, it's early spring, and we think there's nowhere for a unicorn to hide. But we keep looking to left and right. And there's a great shrub full of green leaves, the first shrub to have its leaves out. Like a green ball, it's an elder shrub in England. I don't know what it is in Australia or in Italy or in Brazil. And you see the branches shake slightly. It could be a unicorn. So creep in, creep up to it and bend down. And out hops a glorious blackbird. And you realize it could have been a unicorn. You don't even know what size a unicorn is meant to be. And you smile and you wander on and you see a stream in front of you. And by the side of the stream, there is some mud. Squat down and look in the mud. What are those footprints? Are they unicorn footprints or are they deers? Hoof prints, I should say. 
You don't know. You don't know what a unicorn's hoof print looks like, but it could be. And suddenly, in the, to the left of you, there's a cacophony of birds. So you wander over. Maybe birds set up an alarm call when a unicorn is passed. But you see nothing. Just blackbirds swooping and swirling in the air. Dancing. An aerial dance of beauty. And then you find yourself in a birch. Glade. Silver birches. And spring has advanced, so there are bluebells dotting the green, green grass. And you lean against a birch tree. And you realise, unicorn or no unicorn, this might be as good as it gets. Wonderful. Peace, sunlight, the green grass, the blue of the bluebells, the silver of the birches. And from the corner of your eye, you see a large bluebell. It looks as if there's a broken branch that points straight at the ground, touching the green, green grass. And as you look, the bluebell seems to blink and in a flash, there's a whirl of energy and light, as if moonlight has created a vortex behind a birch tree. There is a flash of silver hoofs, a flying mane. The birds scream from the trees again, from the top of the ash tree. And then, nothing. Was there anything there? Does it matter? Did we see something? We saw the shrubs and we saw the green grass and we saw the beauty of a silver birch glade. And as we say, thank you for that. My goodness, look at that bluebell. The most beautiful sight in the world at the moment. And as we gaze at it, the glade fades from our view like mist and a morning meadow. And we open our eyes and we smile. We're all together now. We may have seen a unicorn. Our time is nearly up. Not quite yet. Ah, oh, someone is going to look for a unicorn tomorrow. I am so glad. That's wonderful. Someone is going to dream all about it. And um, if any unicorns are listening, then um, in New Zealand, there is good unicorn fodder. So that's marvellous. So let's just think about what we've done today. Why did we do that? We did it for our refreshment. We did, this, did it to take us away from the world and remind us that we've got all the resources inside ourselves to be completely in the right place at the right time and being enough. Not having to be better at anything, learn more, be more druidy, anything. We just immerse ourselves in our inner worlds and are enriched by them. The, the benefits are that it's an antidote to feeling jaded and careworn. And instead of taking us away from this really important world where we must interact with people and we want to, and situations and, and uh, politics and all these important things, it doesn't take us away, it brings us back refreshed. And it allows us to truly appreciate our wonderful world. Whether we see dragons or unicorns or anything, we are closely observing the real world that hi might hide these wonders, but is actually wonderful enough in itself. Um, if you get hooked on the 
feeling of wanting to be embedded in the real world. This can lead on, of course, to being part of owl watches, bat spotting, um, even the first thing I did the first year I was in Somerset, um, picking toads up and helping them across the road when they're going to their traditional mating grounds so they don't get some, um, uh, don't get squashed by cars in their thousands. All sorts of ways we can interact with the world and looking for mythic creatures is a good way to keep our interest. Oh, I'm sort of going to run out of time, but I wanted to say, don't be bounded only by unicorns. When you're by the sea this summer, listen for the mermaid's song and see how much more you hear uh, of the seashore. Um, look for griffins in the golden sunlight over sunflower uh, fields and cornfields. And in the, um, in the winter, why not go and look for the cave of the sleeping earth dragon? Something very exciting to do. So, thank you for your wonderful comments. Toads in Nottingham, good. Someone helps tarantulas across the road oh my goodness thank you for doing that for us because um i think i'd think twice about that i hope you have thick thick gloves on um wow what was i going to say just to finish it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege we've had a wonderful time turtles as well i'm going to read all your comments uh, afterwards that'd be wonderful and next time a child uh, your own, a niece, a nephew, a grandchild, whoever it might be, wants you to read their favourite book for the millionth time, say, well, put the book down and get your Wellingtons and warm coat on, because today we're really going for a bear hunt and take them out to see bears in their local woods and see what happens. So thank you for all the lovely comments. Goodbye. And may our wild spaces, within and without, always be open for maidens to exercise their unicorns. Bye-bye.